internal uh, strategy and innovation group at HP, Hewlett Packard in Silicon Valley. Um, have worked across many, many industries uh, over the last 15 years, uh, doing work and building organizational capability related to innovation. And I'm going to share with you a lot of the very practical tips and tricks uh, for creating innovation culture and a lot of actually fresh case examples that uh, really haven't been shared before out there in the world. Uh, I've written about them. Um, they come from a variety of sources, uh, from clients to um, just best practices that I've uncovered uh, through many, many, uh, many years of experience. So um, I, I want you to, to just um, type in the chat box if you have an innovation initiative in your organization, just type yes or no, innovation initiative focused on culture. So just kind of want to get a feel for our participants out there in your organizations or in your work. Uh, do you have an initiative focused on innovation culture uh, going on? You just type in yes or no. I'd like to just kind of get a, a quick flavor uh, for what you've got going on. And be sure when you send it to send it to everyone so we can all see it uh, if you can do that. Um, so they're coming in now. A few of you do. You know, we'll just watch them come in and see kind of who's got uh, what going on. It looks like most of you actually do. Um, which is not a surprise. Um, there's never been more resources, books, articles on innovation. Um, and it really, you know, I think that um, it really started out probably uh, 10 years ago with a real emphasis on disruptive innovation, business growth. And over the last few years, a lot of um, large and small organizations are recognizing the importance of culture. Uh, and building organizational capability. So we know why, because we've seen some of the casualties of disruptive innovation. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, the, the Borders and Blockbuster and BlackBerry, which is still around, but, you know, kind of been disrupted by Apple. Um, my 15-year-old daughter doesn't even know what Encyclopedia Britannica is anymore. It's all Wikipedia. So, you know, you look at the casualties of disruption and you just realize that, you know, if we don't figure out how to continually innovate, we may not be around in the future. So it's not kind of surprising that, uh, that you know, people are more focused on organizational um, capability building for innovation culture. So it's interesting. Most of you do have, it looks like, just a, maybe I think I see one no on, on this list. So most of you have initiatives. Um, as I go through the rest of these slides, um, if you have questions on a specific topic or a slide or overall, type it into the chat box. Um, I may address it right away as I'm talking. I may hold it, um, but we'll make sure we get to all of your questions uh, by the end of our, our session here. So we know that innovation is important. Now, here's the, the kicker, though. Arguably, Apple has been one of the most innovative companies in the world. And you've got the CEO saying there's no formula for innovation. Um, so basically, you know, when we think about innovation, if there's no formula, how do you do it? What is the, what's the secret? And the challenge is that, you know, there's, there are processes, of course, but there's a lot of soft stuff involved in the innovation process. And so the premise of why most organizations these days are recognizing that the soft stuff is really where the competitive advantage is going to be long term. It's because competitive advantage is now seen as temporary. Products, services, business models will go away. Whatever you are doing today, 10 years from now, probably won't exist. A few years from now, may not exist. Culture then is really the only sustainable or even semi-sustainable competitive advantage today. Um, and the challenge, again, is that every organization has a unique culture and must unlock its own unique innovation culture to do so because what might work for Apple or Google might never work or even stifle innovation in other companies. And so while there are some, some principles at play, the challenge is every organizational culture is different. So how do you do it? So the, the good news about culture and innovation culture is that if you can really nail it, the soft stuff is the hardest stuff for competitors to copy. And it can give you 
a semi-sustainable competitive advantage, whereas a product or a technology or a service will probably eventually be disrupted or you'll need to cannibalize it. And so the soft stuff is really where the competitive advantage is. So then the question is, okay, well, how do you do it? So what do you, how do you figure out how to create your own unique innovation culture? Um, a lot of uh, organizations that I've researched as well as worked with, um, you know, have struggled with really figuring out, well, what is culture to us and how does it tie to innovation and how do we actually, you know, what are the levers that we pull uh, to shape innovation culture specifically? So let me start out with a little bit of an innovation quiz for you. So I'm going to show you some corporate values on the next slide. And I want you to look at these companies, Coke, Facebook, Google, Uber, and Verizon. And I want you to type into the chat box as I show you the next slide, which of these companies do, do these values belong to? So thanks, Carrie, for putting in the, uh, the list here. Um, and it's in, the, it's in the chat box, so you can kind of have a reminder. So look at these values. You know, these belong to one of these companies. Communication. We have an obligation to communicate. And we believe that information is meant to move and that information moves people. Okay, respect. You know, we, we're really, you know, we want to be treated like we want to be treated ourselves. We want to treat others like we want to be treated ourselves. Integrity. Um, when we, you know, we, when we work with customers and even prospects, sales prospects, we work openly, honestly, and sincerely. And excellence, of course. The great fun here will be for all of us to discover just how good we can really be. So type in who, which company you think these belong to, Coke, Facebook, Google, Uber, Verizon. And let's see what we got. We got a few Verizons. We got a Facebook, a couple of Facebooks. We got a Google. Anybody else want to put, uh, put your, your guess in the hat? We got a couple that uh, have been sent in, another Verizon, another Coke. Someone says all of them. Google. Okay, so I'm going to give you the, uh, the answer right now. And the answer is it's Enron. You guys remember Enron, right? So Enron, those are the values that Enron had, one of the most infamous organizations for pulling the wool, the, the wool over the eyes of the public, the markets. And why did I give you a trick question? Because the point is, is that values, you can say what you want to say, it's what you do that matters. And what you do that matters is really about experiences. Experiences, when you're shaping culture, uh, are really the, the fundamental essence of how you shape an organizational culture. And the experience is about how do you shape the experiences of your employees, of those you're working with, your partners, and experiences, whatever happens out there, shape the assumptions about what's good behavior, what's bad behavior, what are the value, real values of the organization, and those assumptions shape behavior, which then that behavior reinforces the kind of experiences that are happening in the organization. So culture, while a lot of organizations, I've worked with some organizations that look at culture as a, a, a bad word. They don't even want to use it because it's so unclear about what it even is. Well, it's pretty simple. Create experiences, experiences shape assumptions, assumptions shape behaviors that then reinforce the kind of experiences that happen, which then continue to reinforce assumptions. So if you want new, a new culture, new assumptions, if you want to rewrite the unwritten rules, then what you need to do is you need to change the experiences that people are having in the organization. That will help you rewrite the unwritten rules. So then the question is, how do you do it? So I've come up with a, a simple model, um, and it, it, it's based on a, a lot of other models and, and kind of work that's been out there. Uh, you might know Galbraith's star model. Um, but basically what I've done is I've taken kind of a holistic view of the different dimensions or levers that you can pull that essentially will help you reshape 
experiences that people have in the organization towards innovation. Because if you can, you can either decide to shift things and pull levers and change these things on the map from leadership to structure process metrics, rewards and recognition, people and talent, uh, as well as technology, you can either shape those toward innovation or you can let them kind of happen in various either connected or disconnected ways and you may get innovation. But you probably won't be getting a culture of innovation unless you're very intentional about it. And so I've got this invisible advantage map because culture is invisible. But what you want is you want to be able to create your invisible advantage, your invisible competitive advantage by making these things work in unison, in symphony. And so what I'm going to share with you today are examples, many of them fresh new examples that really haven't been written about, related to what can be done to shape experiences, to drive new assumptions that drive new behavior so you get innovation. You can do things in any one of these areas, but the, the value of, or the, the opportunity, I should say, for creating a culture of innovation is when you do these things in combination. And so I'm going to take you through this right now. If you have any questions, again, feel free to just type them in the chat box. We can make this a bit of a dialogue if you'd like. Okay. So the starting point. The starting point when you're thinking about creating a culture of innovation is really about being intentional with your innovation intent. So what are you trying to do related to your innovation? Um, I've worked with a lot of organizations that say, hey, we want a culture of innovation. And I start out by saying, well, why? Why do you want a culture of innovation? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? And it's really being intentional about what you want out of your innovation initiatives, which is the starting point. So one of the one of the challenges these days uh, is that we've been, become enamored with this whole concept of disruptive innovation. Um, yes, it's important. You saw those companies, Borders, Blackbuster, Blackberry, Cyclopedia Britannica. This is a sidebar. They all start with the letter B, so maybe that's uh, something to, to be aware of. Uh, but uh, but the, the whole notion that we're enamored with disruptive innovation because we want the game changers. We want the big disruptors that create new markets. And that's great. We should have those. But we also need to remember that innovation also is about continuous improvement. It's about incremental innovation. It's about just being competitive and creating differentiation in our core business every day. And that's the incremental side. And then in the middle, you've got the sustaining innovation, which is really about how do we kind of take, create the next generation of whatever we're doing. Um, so kind of taking our core business to the next level. That requires some, some significant effort, not just a little tweak. And so, you know, if you look at innovation as a portfolio from the incremental to the disruptive, then innovation intent starts with, well, what do we want? Do we want everyone to be doing disruptive innovation? Probably not. Do we want everyone doing incremental innovation? Well, you might work for a little while, but then you may get disrupted because you're not working on the bigger stuff. So it's really about a portfolio view when you think about an innovation culture. But you've got to manage these things differently, and I'm going to share with you uh, some examples of that. So when you think about where, where innovation intent comes from, it comes from your it does come from your values. It comes from your mission. It comes from your strategy. And I'm going to give you an example of Intuit. Intuit is a software company in Silicon Valley. They're a financial services software. They make uh, QuickBooks and Quicken and TurboTax. And they have an innovation intent that drives every employee, no matter what function, which is basically everyone knows that their mission is to improve their customers' financial lives so profoundly they can't imagine going back to the old way, which basically means if you're in a product group, you're trying to just radically improve people's the way that people manage their finances. But if you're in even at the HR group, 
you want to be able to innovate HR so that you can bring in the best talent or you can make the organization so efficient and effective that we can still impact customers' financial lives. So there's a line of sight, essentially, to the end customer in, the, in their mission. And their mission is really about innovation. They have an innovation-focused mission. So that's one way to, to focus on it. Another example, uh, this is from KQED, which is the public media station, television, radio, online in San Francisco. Um, I've had an opportunity to work with them, and basically they define innovation as pretty simple. You know, it's not necessarily about the big disruption, but it's doing the right thing for their audience, their, you know, their customers their community, their supporters, their staff, and the organization by continually assessing, prioritizing, and improving whatever they're doing and how they're doing it. And then they have their operating principles which essentially um, operationalize that to a certain extent. So they've defined innovation in a certain way that makes sense to them. They have their own innovation intent. So the, the point of this is that innovation and innovation culture starts out with some framing. What are we trying to achieve? What do we want? How do we define innovation overall? And how do, we, how do we give a line of sight to what innovation means to every employee? So that's the starting point. Now I'm going to give you some examples now of each of these different dimensions of creating innovation culture. And I'm going to tie them to, to some strategies that you can use. And I'm going to give you some examples of structure, process, metrics, rewards, recognition, uh, people development, um, technology, and leadership. So I'm going to take you through the model uh, at this point. So again, if there's any questions at all, feel free to type them in the chat, uh, or we can hold them till the end. Uh, that's just fine. So the first strategy, create a structure for unstructured innovation. Because a lot of companies like to try to create their you know, finely tuned stage gate process with, with linkages and Visio charts and yes, you need process. But innovation is a combination of the left brain and the right brain of analytics and creative process. And so you want to create the structure for the unstructured to happen. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing you have to think about if you're going for the bigger stuff is you need to separate it out. There's a lot of words for this. You can call it an ambidextrous organization. Um, you can you know, call it a skunk works and incubators. There's a lot of different words for this. But there actually are very specific organizational structures to support both the sustaining innovation and the disruptive innovation. If less so on the incremental, you can do other things for the incremental. You can still do incremental through these, these models. But you know, if you don't separate out the sustaining and the disruptive, especially the, the disruptive, the antibodies of that or of your organization will usually kill kill the new stuff um, because they represent various kind of resource threats and and kind of new business models that uh, are just foreign to the organization. So these are different models, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them in super detail here. But you can create an incubator or an innovation lab, and there's examples uh, in insurance and technology who are doing that very well. Um, you can create a corporate venturing group that goes out like. Uh, Coke's uh, venturing emerging uh, brands business that essentially goes out, identifies emerging brands that have already been created that are in market, and then acquires them as in a P&L, and then scales them using Coke's massive distribution channel. So that's another example. And then you have Procter and Gamble. Uh, that's uh, you know, kind of been out there for a while, but Connect and Develop, which absolutely makes sense. It's coming out of uh, R&D, and you go out there, you find technologies and, and innovations that are, that are out there in the world, and you acquire them or license them, and you bring them in-house, so you connect them, and then you develop them further. Um, and then you've got self-managed incubators, um, like uh, Johnson & Johnson. You know, they have their own incubator. They bring companies into it. It's kind of um, sits outside of the, the core structure. Uh, and then you have uh, external incubators where you're just a sponsor of it. So KQED, the example I mentioned, they basically sponsor uh, an incubator. They pay money and they um, get access 
to some of the startups that uh, are in San Francisco. The incubator is called Matter. Um, Cisco, spin-ins, they fund um, external startups and then spin them in rather than spin them out. Then you have uh, the venture capital model as well. This is for the big stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus more on some of the things you can do organizational-wide to create that culture, but, to, but culture also is about structure. So if you want the big stuff, sometimes you have to really separate it out is the point here. So the other thing you can do, and this is more broad-based, this can apply to any and every uh, employee, is you wanna bring the outside in. So if you have that you know, kind of inside-out perspective, you're kind of insular. What, we, what we, we want for innovation is having that external perspective. So there's a number of things you can do here. So into it again, um, they actually have given a little toolkit to every employee, and the goal there is they do these, these follow me homes. It, it's not as creepy as it sounds, actually, but what they do is basically they identify customers, and they go and follow them home. Um, and see how they're living their lives and their houses and managing their finances and kind of what their issues are. So they're trying to get employees into the environments of customers. Um, so that's one thing that uh, some people do there. But not everybody can go out and go visit a customer. That's not realistic. Um, it's kind of more of a selective thing. However, what they also do is they create these things called customer office hours. So what are customer office hours? Basically, once a month, they bring a group of customers inside to their office and they just sit there and you can, if you're an employee, you can come in, you just listen to them, you can test an idea, you can ask them questions. So they're bringing the customer in on a regular basis. So that outside in perspective into it is really fine tuned that. Now, another example, which is um, in my book in a, in a lot of detail is Zipcar. Um, Zipcar a number of years ago um, had, you know, Zipcar was one of the first um, kind of uh, sharing apps out there, or share, sharing business models actually out there. Uh, and they were, you know, they had a website. You can, you know, if you know Zipcar, um, they they kind of created the the basis for the sharing economy in Airbnb and Uber. Um, but a number of years ago, probably four, five, three or four years ago, Zipcar realized that most of its customers were millennials and were wanting to use their mobile phone to do everything. Well, Zipcar had grown up online. And so what they realized is that they needed to radically do things, do things radically different. So one of the things they do now is they do these member roundtables, they call them. But basically it means customers come in on a Saturday. Their employees are there with these customers and they do these innovation sessions to redefine the customer experience and Zipcar uh, offerings and business model, so on an ongoing basis. So they're bringing customers inside, not just for information, but for co-creation of new opportunities. So that's, that's something that you can do in terms of process, which isn't a huge thing, but it really goes a long way to bring that voice of the customer into the innovation process. Okay, strategy number two, measure what's meaningful. So Peter Drucker once said, you know, you get what you measure, um, or what's measured improves, I think is the actual quote, uh, which basically means if you focus on it and measure it, you're going to get more of it. So how does that tie to innovation is the question. Well, the first thing you want to do is you really want to think about the end game. And uh, Yum Brands, which owns KFC, uh, probably 10 years ago or so, um, basically had kind of tapped out its growth in the United States. And it was really recognizing that it needed to innovate um, and enter new markets. And so it identified a metric that was really going to kind of be the, the, the end goal of where it wanted to, to focus, which was essentially increasing the, per, the percentage of international profit compared to domestic U.S. profit. So they went into China. And uh, if you know the story of young brands, it's kind of up and down, up and down. But one of the things that this illust illustrates is they go into China. Well, Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is what KFC stands for, uh, you know, eating a, a, a chicken leg that's breaded and fried isn't exactly a natural Chinese thing to do in terms of how people eat, you know, biscuits and gravy and all that. 
So by going into China and having this innovation intent that they needed to, or the, I'm sorry, the, the metrics around, you know, international sales profit, they were forced to innovate and create kind of new offerings for the Chinese palate. And um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but it's something like yateo, which is essentially street food. And they innovated around that. And their profits have now, from international, um, uh, have increased from 20% of their overall profit to 70 and has been responsible for a lot of their growth. So they identified that in-game metric. Now, that's a big kind of hairy enterprise metric, which rallies an organization. But there's other metrics that you can use, and this is a little bit of an eye chart, but there's a lot of different options for metrics. And um, I've included a few of them here on the screen, um, and you'll have these slides, but you, know, you can focus on a number of input metrics, which are basically things that you can do organizationally and measure organizationally that have an impact on innovation and innovation culture. So basically you can look at products, you know, revenue from new products or services introduced in the past three years, revenue from products or services sold to new customer segments. You can look at leadership. You can look at um, the percent of leaders' time that are that's focused on the future rather than kind of fighting fires today. Um, you can focus on innovations or growth op opportunities that are coming from partnerships or external innovation driven by leadership. You can look at em employees. You can measure, you know, the number of teams that are submitting projects for innovation awards, uh, assuming you have innovation awards, and if you don't, you should. Um, you can look at the number of employees trained in the innovation process. Uh, there's one insurance company um, that I'm working with right now that's training all their employees in design thinking, and that's one of their goals. Um, customers, you can look at the number of projects that actually directly involve customers in the front-end innovation process, like what Intuit or Zipcar has been doing. There's a variety of metrics, but having a portfolio of metrics that are, that are um, designed for your own organization and what your own innovation intent is, is really key to creating um, kind of a, a mechanism for measuring what you want. Because if you don't measure what you're looking for, you don't really know if you've ever achieved it. So that's metrics. Now, I'm going to go to strategy number three. Strategy number three, give worthless rewards. That's kind of, uh, kind of a play on words. Basically, worthless rewards are more valuable than money. And what do I mean by that? So what do I, what do I mean? Um, sorry about the, um, the font, I think, changed when these, these were uploaded. But basically, um, when it comes to rewards, formal rewards, so we're not talking about money, but we're talking about, you know, kind of your innovation award at the end of the year or quarterly. Formal rewards should beckon the brand should beckon the brand. What does that mean? It means, in this example, KQED, again, the public media company. They, KQED is the name. KQED, they have the Q award. So they are, are connecting their award to their name. They also created an innovation group to, to collect ideas and to give these awards called the Cubation Team. And basically, what they're looking at very specifically is they're looking at behavior. They tied the awards to the brand and to specific behaviors they're looking to reinforce, like making strategic decisions, continually assessing how work is done and reinventing work process, building efficient processes, applying technology to what they do, and focusing in on speed. Because in the media and entertainment business and news business, speed is absolutely critical. So they've identified these parameters that they want to reinforce. And so they're giving awards that connect to the brand that reinforce those specific things. Pretty simple, very powerful. Now another example, uh, which is uh, one of my favorites. Um, I've done a little work with uh, Colgate Palmolive. Uh, they have a research and development group in, in Piscataway, New Jersey. And uh, one, of, one of the stories that they tell um, is that a couple uh, kind of researchers, research scientists, uh, had a big project. 
and they needed cross-functional support. Um, and they needed a whole, you know, kind of network of internal partners and players, and they did this project. At the end of the project, they were kind of having their project review, and the, research, the researchers who were leading this had purchased a bunch of wooden nickels. Now, wooden nickels are kind of, uh, you know, kind of a, um, uh, known for being worthless, so I guess that's where, that's where that originally came from. And what they'd done, what they did is they bought these wooden nickels and they handed them out to their, their, their team as a thank you, and kind of a joke you know, to say, you know, we don't have money to kind of give you a, a big, you know, kind of reward or, or gift card or things like that, but we're going to give you wooden nickels just to show appreciation. Well, what happened was people who received those wooden nickels, when they had projects that required cross-silo and, and other people to collaborate, they give their wooden nickels to them in public as well. And then what, would started, what started to happen is that people who would come back to their desks after lunch and there'd be a few wooden nickels sitting at their desk as a thank you for doing something uh, on a project and you might not even know who gave it to you. So what started to happen is a recognition economy, some of these wooden nickels, people would start even buying their own wooden nickels and giving them out, was created. And it was created organically, but it started to reinforce the kind of collaboration that was going to be important for them to take things to the next level. It was very organic, but you can also facilitate some of this uh, as well. So thinking about how to facilitate recognition for the things you want on a peer-to-peer -peer basis is very important. There's some technology platforms and kind of gift card platforms that allow for that. But this is a wonderful example of, of, uh, of rewards. Um, not financial, driving culture. Okay, innovation culture strategy number four. Provide tools of the innovation trade. If you ask people to go and innovate, but you don't give them the tools, it could be a little frustration and actually could undermine your culture of innovation. So what does that mean? Provide tools of the innovation trade. It means give people toolkits. There's a lot of toolkits out there. Um, one of my favorites is Adobe Kickbox. I wrote about this extensively in the book. Um, there's a, it's actually free. If you go out and you type in Adobe Kickbox, um, you can go to their website and their whole toolkit is available. Um, well, not the whole toolkit, because here's what's in it. What's in it is a number of different tools for design thinking, um, six-step process, and what's also in it is for employees, is a uh, Visa gift card for $1,000. Now, there's a little bit of a catch. So in order to get the, the kit box, you actually have to sign up for a workshop on design thinking. So they kind of make you go through a little training. Um, but anybody can get this, tool, the, this, this toolkit. And in that toolkit, you got the process, and that $1,000 gift card uh, allows for anyone, no strings attached, there's a little string. You need to use it to buy Google ads or other ads to advertise your idea, your early stage idea, in order to, to tally up are people clicking that link? Is it compelling? And that link may not go anywhere, or it may go to a dummy website that's not even branded Adobe to just test ideas. Does it have enough legs? Are there enough clicks? Can you frame it up well enough in order to drive traffic to indicate that there, there's something there that you can then maybe go out and develop further. So they want everyone experimenting using this toolkit, and that's a resource to do that. They also throw in a Starbucks gift card because caffeine is uh, part of an ingredient for innovation <laughs> as well. Uh, but again, freely available toolkit. Now there's a whole bunch of other toolkits also. Uh, a lot of tech companies have toolkits. Uh, Intuit has their own. Um, what I like about Intuit is it's probably four pages, and it's really simple. Um, this is also available freely online. Type in Intuit Catalyst Toolkit, and you'll be able to download it. Basically, it goes through the design thinking process. Start with deep customer empathy. Go broad to go narrow basically means the brainstorming process and prioritization process, and then conduct rapid experiments with customers. It's three steps, and they've given it to every employee in every function. Because even in HR, even in finance, you have internal customers, you should be using this with them. Um, the Australian government has gotten into the act 
they call it the Public Sector Innovation um, Toolkit. You can type in that too. You can go there. There's a whole bunch of tools. Uh, the government's gotten in the act. And even in the United States, you've got the Community Collaboration Innovation Toolkit created by the uh, Colorado Department of Education, which is all about how a school district can innovate. So the idea here is that you create a toolkit oftentimes using freely available resources. Um, customize it to yourself, probably based on design thinking, the innovation process, um, and make it accessible and simple for every employee, and then let them have at it. And when I say let them have at it, it means you're giving them a structure, you're giving them a process, you're giving them the tools, and then you give them a little bit of um, opportunity to use it, and then submit those ideas, and I'll talk a little bit about how that works uh, in a moment. Okay, so strategy number five, grow talent that grows the top line. Grow talent, people. Focus on growing the top line. Now, what does that really mean? Well, what that basically looks like is something that um, NBC Universal is doing. Um, it, to me, it's the future of leadership development. So what they've done at NBC Universal, you'll see in the top left there in that uh, slide, that's what they call their talent lab. They have two talent labs. One is in um, uh, Burbank um, in LA. Uh, the other is uh, in New York City. And it's a high-tech, collaborative space driven by uh, the VP of talent. And essentially, people come in, they go through a program, Usually it's multi-month. Uh, multi um, they have a few different programs. One called, one's called Drive, as in drive the business, and one's called Case, as in do a case study on the business. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, Drive because it really is focused on growing the top one. They bring in, um, usually it's a VP level um, or above, uh, executives. Um, and this is a leadership development program, usually about uh, – four months, they have a specific topic that's critical to the future of their business, um, defined by usually it's their uh, head of business strategy. And these teams, who are all executives being primed to, to run the company, are asked to, in the leadership development program, identify an answer to the challenge, a whole new business model, and a recommendation for what the company can do. They are driving business model, product and service innovation, and acquisitions through leadership development. It's the, at the end of the, the session, at the end of the time that they're working, they're actually pitching their ideas to head of strategy and others to essentially incorporate what they've just done into their enterprise business strategy. So they're using talent development, leadership development, to drive new business models and growth for the company. And those new mindsets are shaping the leadership's mindset. The, the leadership mindsets are being shaped by this program, which is impacting how they operate in their day-to-day -day business, but also generating uh, whole new opportunities. So I'm going to um, keep going just from a time standpoint, but I will get to some of your questions um, that, uh, that are coming in. Um, make innovation everyone's job. Um, and I actually, we'll talk about the innovation jams um, and kind of how those work because that's actually part of this uh, example. So how do you make innovation everyone's job? Um, well, there's, I've been talking about it. So you can create a toolkit. Um, the uh, AAA Insurance Group, um, California State Automobile Association's Insurance Group, um, the AAA insurer, they um, have given every single employee an innovation toolkit and then kind of like Adobe did where they are providing workshops, but um, it was more voluntary with Adobe, they're actually having every single employee, all 3,800 employees, go through their innovation training. And these are call center employees, the people who are working in claims, and as well as executives. I mean, it goes all the way up and down. And they're all using that toolkit, which is basically about design thinking, about customer insight, about idea prioritization, and about rapid prototyping. You can see some of these pictures. There's rapid prototypes down there that anyone and everyone is creating. So 
they are using these sessions not just as a case study in theoretical issues. They're actually, they've actually had executives define the topics in those training sessions related to the business units going through the training. So actually the ideas on that wall that you see there are actual ideas that business can implement. So they're going through a training that's hands-on, people experience it, they see the results of that training having an impact you know, the next day or the next year, and it's infusing a new way of working uh, so that innovation is about continuous improvement as well as about the big stuff. Now, the question about innovation jams, um, great question. There's this organization as well as others have used innovation jams and there's a number of different platforms out there. Um, Spigot is a good one. Right Idea is a good one. And essentially, you're, you can do the same kind of design thinking process, but you do it online. Now, the, the risk of that is that it becomes just an online suggestion box where you're submitting ideas. You don't want that. What you want is a challenge that's time bound, and then there's a call to action for employees to submit ideas. And uh, innovation jams are getting more steam, especially in global organizations. Um, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there on it, um, and we can talk a little bit more about it uh, at the end of our, our session. Um, the talent labs, let me just kind of hit that question since I was on the slide. Um, from a talent lab standpoint, your question is, does it run over a couple of successive days, or does it last over a couple of months with the final, final unveiling presentation? So their talent lab, starts out with about three, a three-day session, and then there's work in between. So typically, they, they, a lot of times what they do is they actually go to Silicon Valley, Comcast, who, who's the parent company of NBC Universal, has uh, kind of a, um, an incubator there, uh, innovation media lab there. They also have a media lab in New York. But what they do is they go visit Comcast in Silicon Valley, they go do some other visits, they talk to customers. Um, they're responsible for essentially creating a pitch so there's kind of a front end piece. Well, when you plan it, as I was working with them, when you plan it, you kind of under, you work with a kind of a core team. You develop the, the, the business issue, the, the challenge you want to focus on. Um, you define it, might have multiple challenges for different teams. Then you get together for a few days um, to kind of set the groundwork, talk about, you know, kind of the bait, you know, what's innovation, what are business models. You give them the challenge. They go do that usually for about two months, three months, come back with an answer, and then you kind of provide your pitch. And that can be done in, you know, kind of a Shark Tank format or, or others. Um, so that's, um, that's this people side of it. I'll get to the other questions that are coming in uh, at the end, um, which is actually coming up in a second here. Um, so the last piece that I'll just mention, and it's very kind of high level, is that Leading innovation really requires innovating how you lead. And so what I mean by that is having leaders be aware of their behavior, their language, the stories they tell. It's all connected to those things that I just mentioned. And you want to reinforce all of those dimensions of the invisible advantage map, essentially, so that leaders are um, – always aware of the interdependencies and opportunities to tell a story about um, the great innovations that they were seeing that tie to the kind of assumptions you want to create and then the behavior you want to see. And so the rewards and recognition doesn't just happen once a year. It should be happening, happening verbally throughout the year. So, you know, the, the recognition economy doesn't have to be about wood and nickels. It could be about, you know, storytelling and complimenting. Um, it can also be about watching very specific language um, that's happening in the organization that might be kind of stifling, you know, how people think about innovation. You know, everything a leader says or does, people look at as a symbol for good behavior, bad behavior, and kind of uh, what to do. So, you know, being, being aware of that. So, in terms of other questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of wrap here. I've got one more slide, um, and let me just kind of take some of the other questions that have come in. So, how does innovation from Dawn 
Um, Don Newman's uh, techno terminology question. How does innovation culture intersect or align with development culture or learning culture? So that's a great question. Um, you know, every organization has their own vernacular. Um, as, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, you may never even really need to use the word innovation culture. You could probably talk about if your organization cares about a learning culture and you want to be a learning organization, or a development culture has, has kind of a, um, it's kind of an implication of development culture would be you want to develop new ideas, develop people, develop product services. You don't have to use innovation culture. You could look at these same dimensions and just think about how to reinforce learning through that. Um, learning, innovation is about learning. It's constant learning. Development is about innovation and learning too. So uh, to me, it's, it's these things that intersect and align um, you, you know, either directly or just reinforce each other, and it's kind of up to you to decide um, is how I would look at it. Um, another question. Um, we use Spigot. We also have, thank you, Diane. Um, you use Spigot. You also have a think tank where you can ask questions, vote up or down ideas. Yes, so Spigot's great for that um, as an example. Um, and so Diane's basically saying what they're doing is that they're opening up um, Spigot as a tool which allows people to submit ideas, but not just submit ideas. You can actually um, vote on ideas and use the community and the crowd, crowdsourcing, to prioritize ideas and let the best ones surface. And there's various ways you can do that. But um, I think that if you think about some of the crowdsourcing technologies out there, um, really the goal is to, to not assume that a small team is going to have the best ideas, but to open it up. And you can use these tools also to open it up to your partners, to open it up externally. You've got to get beyond some of the internal barriers around legal and others who are going to kind of probably say that you shouldn't do that. But you should do that. You've got to figure out how to do it. Because if you're not doing it, your competitors are going to do it. And then they're going to get collaboration and ideas happening coming in from the outside. Because you really do want that outside in perspective. Um, another question from Don. Um, what have you found to be, effect, uh, to be effective organization structures for innovation? Chief innovation officer, innovation as part of HR, chief learning officer's role. Who needs to own the infrastructure and resources? Okay, so. There was the rise of the chief innovation officer. I still think it's a, you know, in some organizations it's a totally valid role. Um, I'm working with one organization that just hired one um, because they felt like they needed someone over some of the bigger innovation opportunities. So the sustaining innovation and the disruptive innovation. If you don't have someone driving the bigger opportunities, a lot of times they, they fall by the wayside. And that can also come out of R&D um, as well. But having someone who is a chief innovation officer role who can create linkages and who ideally reports into the CEO is a, is a good structure for driving some of the, the bigger organizational models that I shared in the beginning. However, when you think about HR, a culture of innovation, who owns innovation culture? Who owns culture? Well, you kind of say the executive team, maybe HR, my view is someone has to own innovation culture, and it's an unclaimed opportunity today. Who owns innovation culture? I think it should be HR, personally, because HR owns typically influences and understands culture, the soft stuff, which really has an impact on the business. And I see that as a future strategic role for HR, and if HR can start to have the kind of dialogue that, you know, an example that I just shared in this map, then HR can really kind of put itself out there as a strategic driver of competitive advantage, invisible advantage that, co that other companies can't copy. So I think that that really is an important uh, piece there. Um, other questions. What do I think of innovation management software like Spigot? Um, I, think, I think you need innovation management, whether you need Spigot or whether you, there's other portfolio management tools. Um, depending on your size and what you're trying to do, I think it's important to have uh, a platform to do that. It can be software. I've seen it done in Excel spreadsheets. Um, but it depends on the scale of what you're trying to do. So I do think it's uh, useful. Um, 
And oh, thank you, Diane. You're, you're already responding to, to some of these questions. Great. I'm, I'm catching up with you all of you. Um, from Alba, um, what do you consider to be the biggest discouraging behavior for an innovation team? Discouraging behavior. Well, one of the biggest discouraging behaviors is for senior leadership to say, hey, we want innovation, and then you come up with some innovations, and then they don't really want innovation because they're not going to fund it. They're not going to you know, kind of provide the support to that team that's necessary. So, you know, you ask for it, but you actually aren't doing the things sort of in the invisible advantage map that I have here that are going to promote that team to be successful. So, you know, whether it's funding or whether it's just breaking down barriers so these teams can actually get stuff done, you need kind of that sponsorship. So that would be really, you know, discouraging. The other thing is you can create a culture of innovation, give everybody a toolkit, and if you don't do anything with it, then, you know, if you don't do anything with those ideas, then it's worse than even having not done anything in the first place because then you kind of get that negative innovation culture, um, that, that innovation apathy. And so that's really, um, I think, one of the biggest things you got to kind of be, be aware of. Um, other questions. Some of these questions are coming in to me privately, um, which is fine. Uh, but if you want to, uh, if you have questions and you open it up to uh, and send it to everyone, then everyone can see the questions. But um, BGI is saying, uh, as you've watched organizations implement innovation programs, what are the most important surprises and lessons that you've learned and surprises about the most common mistakes that well-intentioned companies make? What would companies offer to do things differently if they only knew? Um, no doubt about it, one of the biggest mistakes companies make is they create an innovation program, and the ideas that come out of that are measured based on how they measure ideas or, new, uh, or, or based on how they measure the core business. So if a new idea comes out and you measure that idea on profitability in the first year, it'll get killed every time because new ideas and new business opportunities need time to cultivate. So you don't want to use the same metric. This goes back to a metrics conversation. You have metrics to run the core business. Oftentimes you want profit. You usually want profit. Profit, efficiency, um, you know, be lean. You don't want those same metrics applied to the new stuff. That's probably the biggest mistake I see. And then when you apply it to the new stuff, it will get killed every time because you're applying the wrong evaluation criteria to that new stuff. Number one biggest problem out there. Um, so what you need to do is you need to create new metrics for how you look at the kind of new business opportunities you want. So you want to create the, the standard. You want to get traction. You want to be in the market. You want to open up new markets. And you don't want to apply those metrics just yet. Um, so that's, uh, that's my answer to that one. Um, what impact, uh, another one from BGY, what impact is the emphasis on innovation having on the kinds of people companies are hiring? What skills, experience are getting more emphasis in terms of hiring? Um, great book uh, out there uh, a few years ago by Dan Pink, uh, A Whole New Mind. It talks about the rise of right brain thinkers. Um, those people who make connections, those people who have kind of lateral thinking capabilities, those individuals who uh, are good at the front end of the innovation process, those are the harder people to find. However, Innovation requires all skill sets because the innovation process is an end-to-end -end process. You need execution as well. So when we think about talent, yes, you need the front-end, big-picture, strategic thinkers who are, who are kind of coming up with the new ideas and new business models. But a lot of times those aren't the people who should be carrying things forward uh, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis and really executing. So you need a combination of those skills. So I think the front-end skills are the hardest to find and the hardest to, to hire for, but you actually need skills along the continuum of the innovation process. Um, I'm going to keep us going. Um, so last question. What would you recommend HR do to position itself as innovative or able to lead an innovation function? Um, well, what I would uh, do essentially is talk is identify, and some of it's in here, but not as maybe explicitly as you're asking for, um, which is actually a great area of research. Um, what are the um, success factors? Identify the success factors in your organization for driving new opportunities forward with an eye to which of those success factors are actually qualitative 
success factors that require more of the collaboration, more of the um, soft skills, more of the talent, more of the connecting outside in terms of relationship building. Articulate the things that HR is inherently good at, but using an innovation lens and make the business case from that angle. And then HR will be positioned as a potential driver of innovation and innovation culture. So I'm going to, um, oh, great questions, you guys. Uh, this was really fun, actually. So I'm going to kind of leave you with that. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Carrie, who's going to talk a little bit about how to get basically a whole toolkit that has surveys and a whole bunch of other stuff in it related to the invisible advantage unique to uh, the CEL. So Carrie, you want to kind of wrap things up? Thanks, Soren. Thanks for a great webinar, and thanks, everybody, for great questions. Um, so uh, Soren has generously offered our uh, CEO sponsor company to get the the signed books and, and toolkit, and you can see there it's the CEO special, 40% off the book. We can also offer it to webinar attendees. So when I send you the email with the slides and the recording to the webinar, I'll also send you information on how you can get the book at the discount, the signed book with the innovation toolkit as well. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much, Soren, for a great webinar. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and rest of the week. Great. Thanks, everybody.